The New York Giants, one of the NFL's original franchises established back in 1925, are home to the biggest market in sports with a passionate fan base and a history of greatness on and off the field. With almost 100 years of existence, numerous legendary players, coaches, and GMs have made the Giants the well-respected franchise they are. But all it took was one man to completely soil that reputation, and his name is Dave Gettleman. The worst general manager in franchise history, Gettleman inherited the team after a 3-13 season in 2017, and somehow managed to leave the team in an even worse condition four years later. Finally being relieved of his duties on January 10th, 2022, disguised as a retirement, Gettleman finished his abysmal stint as GM with a 19-46 record. Gettleman's tenure was filled with empty promises, missed draft picks, terrible free agent signings, and bad coaching hires that have set the Giants back for years to come. With poor decisions made at every turn, let's look at everything that has gone wrong in New York during the four years of Dave Gettleman. From the moment Dave Gettleman first spoke to the press as GM, he made it clear what his main focus was in turning around a once-heralded franchise after one of its worst seasons in history. We've got to fix the O-line, let's be honest, said Gettleman during his introductory press conference. Long were the days of Sean O'Hara, Chris Snee, and David Deal manning the middle for Big Blue. The 2017 O-line wasn't awful, yet improvements were needed, especially with the scarecrow-like mobility of Eli Manning only getting worse with age. The focus of the 2018 offseason was to improve the mediocre O-line. As Gettleman infamously put it, I believe in the hog mollies. A term coined by the GM referring to the big men in the trenches, Gettleman expressed belief in the current line and looked to only approve upon it. Fast forward to free agency and nearly every lineman from the 2017 roster was out the door. Starters Weston Richburg, Justin Pugh, and John Jerry left in free agency, while other depth pieces like Brett Jones, Bobby Hart, and DJ Fluker also did not return. The only main holdover was left tackle Eric Flowers, who in three years after being picked ninth overall, committed 33 penalties, allowed 16 sacks, and proved he could not be trusted protecting Eli's blind side. Looking more like a bust than a franchise corner piece, Gettleman brought in former Patriot Nate Soldier to play the offensive line's most important position. A proven winner and solid player in New England, bringing in Soldier made sense, but not at the price point at which he was signed. Gettleman made Soldier the highest paid lineman in football with a four-year, $62 million deal, despite never making a single Pro Bowl. The overspending wouldn't stop there as he signed former Jaguar Patrick Omame to a three-year, $15 million deal to be the starting right guard. With heavy financial consideration being placed on two linemen, Gettleman used the rest of the cap to overpay underperforming players at other areas in need, like edge rusher. New York ranked 30th in sacks in 2017 and needed serious help brushing the passer. Jason Pierre-Paul led the team in sacks with 8.5 and, and had been a consistent playmaker for the Giants. He was traded by Gettleman to the Buccaneers for a third rounder. The move was made just a year after previous GM Jerry Reese gave Pierre-Paul a four-year extension. Trading JPP was a money-saving move to give the Giants more cap space, they used this extra cash to give Kareem Martin an overinflated three-year, $21 million contract, despite the four-year vet only having three and a half sacks to his name. Gettleman would make one more head-scratching signing by giving 31-year-old running back Jonathan Stewart nearly $7 million over two years. Big money was spent to try and fix the trenches on both sides of the ball, but work still needed to be done through the draft. In his first draft as GM, Gettleman was blessed with the second overall pick, giving him the potential to draft a franchise-altering player with such a high selection. This class was loaded with talent, specifically at quarterback, featuring two Heisman winners, two signal callers from California, and a gunslinger from Wyoming. Gettleman did not feel that any of the quarterbacks in the draft were worth taking with the second pick, saying, quote, When you're picking this high, you make a mistake, you miss on a quarterback, you probably hurt the franchise for five years. It's a five-year mistake. Little did the Giants know hiring Gettleman would be what really set the franchise back five years. Nonetheless, the Giants opted to use their second overall pick on running back sensation Saquon Barkley. 
His talents as a runner, pass catcher, and kick returner in college made him worthy of a top pick, despite the stigma of drafting running backs this high in the draft. At the time, it seemed like the right choice, as it fit a roster need, and Barkley even went on to win Offensive Rookie of the Year. However, his next three years would be tarnished by injuries, and it's clear by watching him in 2022 that he's lost the burst and agility that once made him a can't-miss prospect. What makes Gettleman's first pick as GM worse is seeing who he could have drafted instead. All-pro talents Quentin Nelson and Josh Allen went with the 6th and 7th picks in 2018, and either one would have fit a big need on offense. Instead, Gettleman waited until round two to address the O-line, drafting guard Will Hernandez. The following picks, you might ask? Pro Bowl running back Nick Chubb, All-Pro linebacker Darius Leonard, and fellow guard Braden Smith, who was graded higher than Hernandez every season. The Giants then used their third-round pick on edge rusher Lorenzo Carter and the Bucks' third-rounder from the JPP deal on defensive tackle B.J. Hill. With plenty of capital used on free agents and high draft picks, there was reason for optimism heading into the 2018 season. New head coach Pat Shermer was primed to make Giants fans forget all about the embarrassment that was Ben McAdoo. The hope was that after leading the Vikings to a top 10 offense, Shermer could help turn the offense around in New York as head coach. Things didn't go exactly as planned, as the Giants finished last in the division with a 5-11 record, despite the draft picks and free agents acquired that year having their best seasons in New York. Five players on Big Blue made the Pro Bowl, including Offensive Rookie of the Year Saquon Barkley. Yet for all the minimal improvements made, the two biggest issues from the year before only grew more problematic in 2018. The Hog Mollies gave up 47 sacks, which was 10th most in the league. The left side wasn't the issue. Will Hernandez and Nate Soldier each received top 20 PFF grades, their best evaluations in New York. Meanwhile, center Spencer Pulley had his best season, earning a 70.2 passing grade. The real issues came on the right side of the line. Free agent signing Patrick Omame started the season at right guard, but was cut just seven games into his $15 million contract. Omame, who gave up five sacks and a whopping 34 quarterback pressures, was released during the Giants' bye week. How the hell are you going to get fired on your day off? Right tackle proved to be just as dysfunctional. After bringing in Nate Soldier, Eric Flowers was moved to right tackle. Without the burden of protecting Eli's blind side, expectations were that Flowers' game would finally start to develop. To the surprise of no one, Flowers' game did not improve at all. He was benched after week two before being released five games into the season. His replacement, undrafted second-year pro Chad Wheeler, a.k.a. the horrible, horrible human being responsible for doing this to his former girlfriend. Despite all the problems with pass protection, the pass rush continued to be the biggest weakness in New York. A year after ranking 30th in sacks, the Giants won up themselves by placing 31st in sacks in 2018. The G-Men got virtually no help from their $21 million man Kareem Martin, who got only one and a half sacks in a full 16-game season, bringing his career total to five sacks in five years as a pro. So to recap, in his first season in charge, Gettleman spent over $100 million on Nate Soldier, seven games of Patrick Omame, one and a half sacks from Kareem Martin, and 17 rush yards from Jonathan Stewart. Quite possibly the worst free agent haul in NFL history, only Soldier would last the length of his contract, and that's not necessarily a good thing given how poorly he's performed beyond the 2018 season. With a tough start to his tenure, Gettleman decided some big changes needed to be made to the current roster. A strong narrative was forming around the team that OBJ was too much of a distraction to his team and was hurting their overall success. With all the sideline tantrums, immature touchdown celebrations, and altercations with kicking nets, OBJ's ego was definitely causing unnecessary problems for Big Blue. Despite all the other issues that existed with the team, specifically in the trenches, OBJ was used as a scapegoat for the team's failures and was subsequently traded just one year after signing a five-year extension. On March 12, 2019, the Giants sent Odell Beckham Jr. and Olivier Vernon to the Cleveland Browns for Jabril Peppers, Kevin Zeitler, and the 17th and 95th picks in the 2019 draft. It was the second year in a row Gettleman traded away the previous season's sack leader, despite the team's continued struggles rushing the passer. 
The trade also got rid of the best pass catcher the Giants have ever had. The acquisition of Peppers led the way for Landon Collins to leave in free agency, meaning three former Pro Bowlers for the Giants were now playing elsewhere. Adding Zeitler was the most valuable part of the deal, as the veteran guard helped fill a major weak spot on the right side of the O-line. The trade as a whole signaled major changes coming for the direction of the team, including more of a focus on the future, meaning the Giants would have to start preparing for life after Eli Manning. Despite Eli having the highest completion percentage and lowest interception percentage of his career in 2018, the Giants legend was 38 heading into the season, and it was clear that a plan for his successor would need to be enacted in the near future. The Giants had the sixth overall pick in 2019 and were in position to take their quarterback of the future. However, many scouts were terrified of this quarterback class, and rightfully so, given the crop of QBs coming out of college that season. Only Heisman winner Kyler Murray was a sure thing to go in the first round. Though the Giants needed to start thinking about their next franchise quarterback, there did not seem to be many franchise talents in this class, and the G-Men still had plenty of other issues to address, namely fixing their pass rush. On the clock with the sixth pick, edge rushers Josh Allen and Brian Burns were available and could have been solid picks based on talent and team need. Nonetheless, Dave Gettleman reached on Duke quarterback Daniel Jones, who most people thought would have been available at 17. Regardless, the Giants had now invested their franchise into Daniel Jones, and they instead used their 17th overall selection on Dexter Lawrence to finally address their needs on the defensive line. While this pick was not bad by any means, seeing Jeffrey Simmons go two picks later hurts considering how much better Simmons has been than Lawrence in 2021. It looked like Gettleman was finally done making poor decisions in the first round until he proved once again just how bad at evaluating talent he truly is. With the Seahawks on the clock with the 30th pick, Gettleman decided to trade three picks to get back into the first round. A rare aggressive move by Gettleman, he traded up to draft cornerback DeAndre Baker out of Georgia. An all-time bust for New York, Baker played horribly his rookie year, allowing over 16 yards per catch and giving up six touchdowns. Opposing quarterbacks had 130.1 passer rating when throwing Baker's way, and the rookie finished nearly dead last in coverage grades for his position. The only thing worse than Baker's game was his character. The defensive back had been called a handful by his own coaches and teammates and was accused of not knowing the playbook and having a poor attitude during practices. Baker's career as a giant would end on the lowest of lows after he was accused of four counts of armed robbery and was cut after only one year in New York. Sure, you can't blame Gettleman for something as unexpected as this, but there were serious red flags surrounding Baker's character even during his college days. And the fact that Gettleman gave up three picks to get this guy makes this a laughably bad decision on the GM's part. The only positive from this draft was fifth-round pick Darius Slayton, who led the team with eight receiving touchdowns as a rookie. With two bad drafts under his belt, Gettleman showed right away he was not the best evaluator of young talent, and he proved through free agency to be an even worse negotiator of contracts. After one of the worst free agent hauls ever in 2018 took away the majority of the team's cap space, the Giants were limited to only a couple signings in 2019. Just months after sending away OBJ because of his large contract, Gettleman decided instead to overpay for a 31-year-old wide receiver in Golden Tate. Tate landed a four-year, $37.5 million deal, and this would not be the only time Gettleman overpaid for a former Lions receiver. The only other noteworthy signings made were one-year deals given to edge rusher Marcus Golden and tackle Mike Remmers. So heading into the 2019 season, the Giants were gearing towards a new-look offense that would feature new receivers with OBJ gone, a new face under center with Jones primed to replace Eli Manning, but the same crappy O-line Giants fans are all too familiar with. The left side of the line still belonged to Solder and Hernandez, but their play started to diminish. For their positions, Solder's grade dropped to 45th in 2019, while Hernandez's grade fell all the way to 58th. On the right side, Mike Remmers ranks just behind Solder in terms of PFF grade, and the two tackles gave up a combined 97 pressures, the most by any tackle duo in the NFL that season. 
Looking at the middle of the line, Spencer Pulley received a three-year, $9.6 million extension before the season started to hold down the center position. He instead was benched for John Jalapio, a player drafted back in 2014 by New England who never played until signing with New York in 2017. Both Pulley and Jalapio would be cut at the end of the season. The only dependable lineman was right guard Kevin Zeitler, who finished with the 7th highest grade among guards, and all it took was trading away OBJ to get someone who can actually block. Still, the Giants gave up 43 sacks that year, a minimal improvement from 2018, and the Giants often struggled greatly because of it. Coupled with Saquon Barkley suffering the first of what would be many lower body injuries in his career, the Giants ended the season as one of the worst offenses in the league finishing with the third most giveaways, 28th worst point differential, and 26th worst yard differential. The offense struggled with both Eli Manning and Daniel Jones under center. These offensive struggles led to the release of offensive coordinator Mike Shula, but that was not the only coaching change made after a putrid 4-12 regular season. The defense had issues all over the field, giving up the third most points and seventh most yards in the league while also getting the fourth fewest takeaways. Along with Mike Shula, defensive coordinator James Betcher was shown the door after two terrible seasons. With both coordinators gone, head coach Pat Shermer would suffer the same fate after a 9-23 record led to his firing, just seven years after he was fired as Browns head coach for also going 9-23. Along with the coaching staff, many people believed Gettleman should have been among the 2019 casualties after two years of horrible free agent signings, questionable draft picks, and bad coaching hires. Nonetheless, John Maris still believed in Gettleman and thought it would be better if the team had some continuity rather than fully hitting the reset button after two seasons. Gettleman was spared and tasked with finding a whole new coaching staff for 2020. Ownership made it clear that they wanted former Cowboys head coach Jason Garrett to be considered for the next head coaching gig. But cooler heads prevailed, kind of, and the Giants instead decided to let Garrett's conservative and predictable play calling hemorrhage the offense as the team's next offensive coordinator. For the vacancy at defensive coordinator, the Giants brought in a familiar face in Patrick Graham. Graham served as defensive line coach for New York under the Ben McAdoo regime, and he was most recently defensive coordinator for the Miami Dolphins, where his defense gave up the most points and third most yards to opponents in 2019. Both these hires were followed by the Giants' decision to make relative unknown Joe Judge the 21st head coach in team history. With zero head coaching experience at any level, the Patriots' special teams coordinator shocked many when he was hired to lead the team. Offensive coordinators like Eric Bieniemy and Kevin Stefanski were looking for head coaching gigs at the time. It could have really helped turn the Giants' offense around. But Judge apparently wooed ownership enough during interviews to convince them his leadership outweighed his inexperience and thus began the Joe Judge era. In a two-year span under Gettleman, the Giants had an almost entirely new look, from the coaching staff to the roster, but they still had not fixed the long-standing issue of the offensive line. The tackle position in particular needed to be addressed as Nate Solder opted to sit out the 2020 season because of COVID-19, while Mike Remmers left in free agency. Lucky for Gettleman, the Giants finished as a bottom five team yet again and had the fourth pick in a tackle-heavy draft to address this issue. Most pundits believed tackle Tristan Wirfs out of Iowa was the best lineman in the draft, and that was well before he had a combine performance for the ages. The 320-pound big man's athleticism proved to be an anomaly, recording a 48540, 121-inch broad jump, and 36.5-inch vertical, well above the averages for his position. Yet Gettleman was more sold on the prospect of Georgia tackle Andrew Thomas. Thomas in his second season has shown major improvements and seems to be a rare solid pick by Gettleman. Nonetheless, Tristan Wirfs had a phenomenal rookie year, only giving up one sack and helping Tampa Bay win their second Super Bowl in franchise history. Thomas was not a bad selection by any means, but Wirfs was voted into the NFL Top 100 as a rookie, was named to the Pro Bowl after another solid season in 2021, and clearly would have been the better selection at number four. The 36th pick, however, was a home run and by far the best selection made by Gellerman as Alabama safety Xavier McKinney fell into the Giants' lap at the top of the second round. 
Though McKinney would miss the majority of his rookie campaign due to injury, the safety would be one of the lone bright spots in 2021, nabbing five interceptions and securing over 90 tackles. Gettleman followed up the Andrew Thomas selection with another tackle in round three, Matt Pear out of UConn, and adding more O-line depth in round five with Oregon guard Shane Lemieux. A flurry of seventh-round picks highlighted by Mr. Relevant Tay Crowder and the 2020 draft hall proved to be the best class assembled under Dave Gettleman. With the O-line addressed in the draft, free agency would be used to bolster the defense, which was one of the worst units in football under James Betcher. The big fish free agent was cornerback James Bradbury, who received a three-year, $45 million deal to be the team's shutdown corner. Inside linebacker Blake Martinez, who ranked top three in tackles the previous three seasons, got a three-year, $30 million payday to be the voice of the Giants' defense. Leonard Williams, who the Giants had traded for during the 2019 season, was given the $16 million franchise tag to see if he could realize the potential he had when selected sixth overall back in 2015. The groundwork was set for a fresh start under a new coaching regime, but things got off to a very rocky start. The Giants opened the 2020 season 0-5, and for the second straight year, Saquon Barkley would get injured, but this time, his season was over after tearing his ACL in Week 2. Also for the third year in a row, Gettleman would trade away the previous season's sack leader, sending Marcus Golden to the Cardinals for a six-round pick. In his place, Leonard Williams would have a career year recording 11.5 sacks, the most by a player under Dave Gettleman. The Giants' pass rush in general had its best year, ranking 13th in the league in sacks. Despite the winless start, the Giants would win four games in a row, including an upset win in Seattle with backup quarterback Colt McCoy. This allowed them to stay in the playoff race thanks to the historically bad NFC least in 2020. Come Week 17, the Giants defeated the Cowboys to finish the season 6-10, woefully the best record under Gettleman, and somehow had a chance to win the division with double-digit losses. Unfortunately, Doug Peterson was willing to lose his job just to flip New York the bird and fully tank his season finale against the Washington football team, giving the nameless ones a 7-9 record and the division crown. While Giants fans and players alike were understandably frustrated with this Bush League move by Peterson, the Giants did not deserve to make the postseason, even with the new expanded 17 format. This is because the offense under Jason Garrett was disturbingly bad. Losing Saquon Barkley for a second consecutive season set the course for what would be the 31st ranked offense in both points and yards. Also, despite all the draft capital spent on linemen that year, the O-line had its worst year in 2020, giving up 3.1 sacks per game, which was second most in the league. Rookie Andrew Thomas had an awful start to his career, giving up the most sacks at his position with 10 and allowing a whopping 57 quarterback pressures, 14 more than any other tackle in football. Will Hernandez continued to decline in his seven starts that year before getting COVID. He was then benched for rookie Shane Lemieux, who managed to have an even worse rookie year than Andrew Thomas. In under 300 pass-blocking snaps, Lemieux gave up five sacks and received a pass-blocking grade of 16.9, by far the worst in the league. The other guard position, manned by the usually efficient Kevin Zeitler, saw the nine-year vet have his worst year as a pro. His 28 quarterback pressures tied a career high, and it was the only season in his career where he graded below a 70. One-year rental Cam Fleming was equally as bad at right tackle, giving up six sacks and recording seven penalties. The only productive lineman was undrafted tackle Nick Gates, who started at center and allowed just one quarterback hit all year. To top it all off, Joe Judge fired offensive line coach Mark Colombo mid-season for insubordination. Despite all the talk about finding hog mollies, Gettleman had made zero progress in the trenches through three years as GM. Given yet another chance in 2021, the demand for improvements had been greater, which makes the results of his final season that much more disgraceful. It was clear that the offensive line wasn't getting any better anytime soon. So instead, Gettleman looked to upgrade the skills positions to bolster the offense and take some pressure off of Daniel Jones. The first order of business 
Releasing Golden Tate after a year full of publicly complaining about targets coupled with the worst production since his rookie year. The Giants wanted younger and cheaper options at receiver. Lucky for the Giants, the 2021 draft class was loaded with elite wide receivers, headlined by three national champions. LSU's Jamar Chase, who won the 2019 Natty with Joe Burrow and company, and two wideouts from Alabama's 2020 championship team in speedster Jalen Waddell and Heisman winner Devonta Smith. Big Blue was hoping one of the three studs would fall to them at the 11th pick. Come draft night, Chase and Waddle were off the board early, but Devonta Smith was still available with the Cowboys on the clock at number 10. Given that Dallas already had a three-headed monster at wide receiver, it was clear that they would pass on Smith and New York would get their coveted wide receiver of the future. Then the Eagles swooped in by trading the 12th and 84th picks to move up to 10 and steal Devonta Smith away from the Giants. Yet again, the Eagles would screw the Giants over, and now the top three receivers were gone with New York on the clock. While the Giants could have sat back and picked linebacker Micah Parsons or tackle Rayshon Slater, Gettleman instead decided to trade back to the 20th pick, sending the 11th pick to Chicago in exchange for a bunch of future draft capital. Not a bad move given that the Bears would end up being a top 10 selection in 2022. However, Parsons is the clear favorite to win Defensive Rookie of the Year after a 13-sack rookie campaign, while Slater was the highest-graded rookie tackle this season. And yet, the Giants wonder why they can't seem to fix their O-line or pass rush. Anyways, the Giants would stick to their plan by selecting wideout Kadarius Toney out of Florida to give Daniel Jones a much-needed weapon. While he has shown promise... There are serious injury concerns with Tony already, as he has missed the majority of his rookie season with a laundry list of various injuries. The first round went anything but smoothly for New York, but things would turn around on day two when the Giants would again have a defensive gem fall to them in the second round. This time, it was Georgia edge rusher Aziz Ajulari, who the Giants took at 50. Ajulari would go on to lead the Giants in sacks with eight in his first season. After missing out on Devonta Smith, Gettleman felt the Giants still needed a number one receiver to beat Daniel Jones' go-to guy. Thus, he went back to the well of overpaying ex-Lions receivers, giving Kenny Galladay a five-year, $72 million deal. Still not satisfied, the Giants would bring in veteran tight end Kyle Rudolph for two years, $12 million to back up Evan Ingram. Believing he solved the offensive issues, Gettleman used the rest of the cap space on defense. Leonard Williams was rewarded after his most productive season, receiving a three-year, $63 million deal. The next objective was finding someone to play corner alongside 2020 Pro Bowler James Bradbury. That's where Dory Jackson comes into play. With only two interceptions in four years, the Titans declined Jackson's fifth-year option and instead released the former first-rounder. Gettleman proceeded to give the underperforming Jackson a three-year, $39 million deal. I guess one man's trash is a ghetto man's treasure. This constant habit of overspending gave New York bottom five cap room for 2022, but it would all be worth it if the money spent equaled more wins. Coming into the 2021 season, the over-under on the Giants' wins was set at seven games, and some people even thought the G-men could earn a wild card spot with big money spent to fix the roster. Even if the playoffs seemed a little overambitious, the Giants surely couldn't get less wins with a new 18-week NFL season and almost $200 million spent in free agency, can they? Well, for all the money spent on bringing in free agents, the biggest impact was made from the players New York lost. Letting Kevin Zeitler walk, even after a rough 2020 season, was inexcusable and the guard has enjoyed a resurgence with the Ravens, allowing only one sack all season for Baltimore. Letting Dalvin Tomlinson leave definitely hurt, but at least the Giants had other options to fill in at defensive tackle like B.J. Hill. That is until Gettleman decided to trade B.J. Hill to the Bengals for center Billy Price, who was on an expiring deal, keeping alive the annual tradition of trading away productive pass rushers. Any optimism surrounding this team was pretty much shot down as early as training camp. On the first day of padded practice, an all-out brawl took place that would pretty much foreshadow just how poorly the 2021 season would go. 
Two weeks into the season, starters Nick Gates and Shane Lemieux were placed on season-ending IR, causing more instability on an already unreliable offensive line. In their places, the Giants signed Matt Skura to play left guard after he was cut by the Dolphins in their terrible O-line, while Billy Price, who was unable to break the Bengals' starting lineup even after being a first-round pick, was plugged in at center. This meant Will Hernandez and the returning Nate Solder would now be manning the right side of the line. Despite being the elder statesman, their production hit rock bottom in 2021, continuing the ongoing issues of weakness along the right side. Neither player graded in the top 60 for their positions, and over 70 quarterback pressures were given up between the two of them. Yet again, only one player held their own in pass protection. After a rough rookie season, Andrew Thomas had a much improved sophomore campaign, allowing only two sacks and 18 pressures all year. The offensive line was weakened by injuries, as was the rest of the roster in a year where seemingly no starters could stay healthy. Over 300 games were missed by injured Giants players in 2021, among the most of any team in the NFL. Saquon Barkley would once again suffer a lower body injury that made him miss a chunk of the season. Kenny Galladay, Sterling Shepard, and Kadarius Toney were amongst the many receivers who consistently missed time with various injuries. Daniel Jones was shut down for the season after Week 12 with a neck injury, and these were just the notable injuries on offense. Blake Martinez tore his ACL in Week 3, while Jabril Peppers tore his ACL in Week 7. Injuries decimated the roster, for sure, but what was really holding New York back was awful play calling. Highlighted by an embarrassing blowout loss to the Bucks on primetime television, offensive coordinator Jason Garrett was fired mid-season after his offense finished 31st in points and yards for the second straight year. Garrett's horrible play calling undoubtedly stunted the growth of Daniel Jones. Jones threw for 24 touchdowns in 12 games as a rookie, but declined the next two years under Garrett, only throwing 21 touchdowns in 25 games. Jones' two biggest weaknesses coming into the league were his ball security and decision-making under pressure, and those only got worse under the tutelage of Garrett. Firing Garrett was the right move, but the Giants had a historically bad final seven weeks with Mike Glennon under center and Freddie Kitchens calling plays. The Giants finished the season with six straight losses, all by more than 10 points. The offense failed to score more than one touchdown in seven of their final eight games, and the team in general only reached the end zone 24 times all season, by far the worst in the league. Kicker Graham Gano led the team in scoring with 104 points, and the next highest scorer was Saquon Barkley with 24. Off-season additions Kenny Galladay and Kadarius Toney finished the season without a touchdown. Shocking, considering even Andrew Thomas was able to get a receiving touchdown at some point this season. The putrid offense reached an all-time low in Week 17 against the 5-10 Bears. New York finished their 29-3 loss with a franchise low of negative 10 net passing yards, the worst total by any team since Ryan Leaf and the Chargers in 1998. If that wasn't bad enough, after the game, Joe Judge would go on an 11-minute rant where he would throw other coaches and teams under the bus, claim to have players begging him to be back next season, and topped it all off by saying, quote, This ain't no clown show organization, which is exactly what someone running a clown show organization would want you to think. For all of Judge's talk about building culture and playing hard for one another, that had not reflected itself on the field all season long, and especially not during the final six losses in this season from hell. The bottom line is that since Joe Judge has been hired, the Giants' anemic offense has finished dead last in points per game, yards per game, and red zone efficiency. The production has only regressed in Judge's second season, and ownership's decision to hold on to him for the time being is concerning to say the least. Forcing Gettleman to retire is the first step in a long process of fundamentally rebuilding the Giants organization. Discarding Jason Gary is another step forward, but holding on to Judge for another year keeps the stench of the 2021 season in the building. The next GM should be the one who decides Joe Judge's fate, and the search for a new general manager should be conducted outside the organization. 
as promoting Kevin Abrams to GM would continue Big Blue's trend of keeping established losers in charge. The Giants' record since 2017 is the worst stretch the franchise has ever had, and even with Super Bowl success in the not-too-distant past, the Giants are currently the biggest laughingstock in football. Ultimately, it's up to John Mara to hire a GM who will right this sinking ship and bring back honor to the name of the New York football giants.